Yeah, love it. Great. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder about the recording too. Good. <clears throat> so welcome to this lecture on radio localization. Um, as maybe you know, giving online lectures is, is very boring if nobody asks questions because I, I just share, stare into this little, little light in my computer and I don't even know if my internet is still working or not. So please feel free to, to ask questions. So I, I will adapt the, the content based on how far we progress. So um, I will also share these slides later with you. So you will have access to all the material. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge my collaborator Gonzalo Seco Granados from UEB in Barcelona who helped me a lot with uh, this material. So my, my plan is the first hour to give more a tutorial on radio localization and then the second hour go into 5G localization. And I, I don't assume that you have any knowledge about localization a priori but maybe that you know a little bit about statistical signal processing and topics like that. All right, so the, the main idea of radio-based positioning is that the radio signal tells you something about the position. <clears throat> and this, this first slide here shows, um, there's a picture I use in my wireless communication course. There's a transmitter on the left, a receiver on the right, and a complex propagation environment. And then if you record the signal at the receiver and you have enough bandwidth, you could see something like this after cleaning it up. All right, so you see here the time scale. This is in nanoseconds. And you see the different arriving paths coming and, and going. And at some point you only receive noise and each of these paths corresponds to either a line of sight or, or a specular multi-path component so something that kind of reflects off some object so all of these paths tell you something about the environment um, the question is then how to use this information <clears throat> now in, in practice you will not have this kind of measurement available you have something whatever your device gives you this could be signal strength this could be timing measurements like time of arrival, time difference of arrival, or round trip time, or angle measurements like angle of arrival and angle of departure. We'll, we'll talk about all of these. Uh, inherently, positioning is a so-called estimation problem. So it, you can use all the kind of tools that you have from estimation theory to, to solve this problem. So we will spend some time on performance bounds using fish information analysis to, to get fundamental insights to know, okay, given this scenario, what is the best that you can achieve? Because then once you know this best, you can design algorithms that can approach this. So this is like, um, like, like Shannon capacity for communication. You have a similar concept called, called Fisher information theory for estimation. Once you know the bound, you can focus on algorithms. So there's a wide variety of algorithms, and I will just talk about a few of them today. You can also use the bounds for doing signal optimization. You can allocate resources in time, frequency, and space to, to optimize positioning performance, just yet, like you would do in communication performance, right? If you have a multi-stream uh, system like OFDM, you would do water filling for uh, rate optimization. You could do something different for positioning optimization. And then there's lots of practical impairments that, that you can consider synchronization issues, calibration, hardware, multi-user localization, latency requirements, and so forth. Now, th the nice thing about working in the area of radio positioning is that Whatever people come up with for communication, you know, it, it was MIMO 30 years ago, and then it was turbo codes, um, polar codes, and it was massive MIMO, millimeter wave, all these technologies, they're very good because for each of them, we can develop something for positioning. We can always reuse what people develop for communication and use it for positioning. So it's a kind of future-proof field in a sense that as, as long as communication is developing, a localization will as well. Now, this is um, kind of to motivate about what we will talk about in the second part of the slide. So this is what I call the, the 5G positioning challenge, where you have a base station, a 5G base station with lots of antennas. You have a user here with lots of antennas, and you want to localize this user. Right? And the signal goes from the base station to the user over a complex propagation environment, bouncing of cars and, and buildings. And what we want to do is to estimate the user location from the signal from a single base station. We also want to estimate where the user is uh, going to, so the orientation. And we also want to synchronize the user to the base station. And if you know anything about positioning, this, is, this actually seems like a very hard problem, right? Because normal positioning systems are not built like this. They, they cannot solve these kinds of problems. And we will try to argue why 5G can. Uh, at the same time, we want to build up a map of the environment. So we want to localize these buildings and maybe track these vehicles that the signal bounces up off on. Uh, 
We also want to do this, and I show here in a dashed line the, the line of sight path. We want to do this when the line of sight is blocked. Okay, so we want to do non-line of sight positioning or obstructed line of sight positioning. And I would say that these are kind of challenging problems. And my hope is at the end, at the end of the tutorial that you are somehow convinced that yes, we can do this indeed. My, my, my goal with this tutorial is that you can, will gain some familiarity with different uh, radio localization technologies that you will be able to mathematically describe the underlying signal models, derive fundamental performance bounds and developing positioning and tracking algorithms. I could have maybe have added the fifth bullet is that you will gain some experience in, in 5G localization. So this will be the, the outline for today. So I will first very briefly talk about some of the standard localization systems or radio based localization systems, then go through um, the physical signal models, performance bounds and algorithms. And in the second part, uh, which is just one bullet here, I'll talk about 5G and beyond 5G localization. Um, if there's no questions, I will go rather fast, so, so please feel free to interrupt. So let's first talk about the different systems. But I guess the one that you know best is probably GPS. So GPS uh, involves a number of satellites that are communicating signals to the ground receivers, to the users. So I, I see GPS as a communication system that is also used for localization. What the user does is it estimates the time of arrival of the incoming signals. Uh, all these satellites are mutually synchronized, that's very important. Once the user, so the, the, this uh, tractor here, has time of arrival estimates from at least four satellites, it can solve a four-dimensional optimization problem, which involves its own position in 3D, so X, Y, and Z, and also its clock bias, right? Because the, the, the the tractor is not synchronized to the atomic clocks of the satellite, so it will also have to solve for this. Now, to do this, it's important that those satellites are kind of spread out geometrically, that they're not all on a line, because then you cannot localize yourself. Another challenge with GPS is that um, when the, the signal is obstructed by a building or, or a window, then you don't have the, this uh, satellite signal, and then you can maybe not localize yourself. And this is called GPS challenge or GPS denied scenarios. Now, in this case, it, it's obvious that you, well, to me, at least it's obvious that you need four satellites because you solve for a four-dimensional problem. Uh, this leads me then to a kind of rule of thumb that is useful to bear in mind for the rest of this tutorial. So all the localization problems that we'll talk about here today, they're estimation problems where we estimate X from Y, and Y could be different things, and X is typically the position. Uh, the observation Y has often inside of it geometric parameters, right? So let's say, Y is a received waveform, and this waveform depends on delays, depends on distances, depends on angles. These are geometric parameters. And let's suppose that inside of the observation we have NY of these parameters. Right. Now, the unknown X um, has a location part. In some cases, it may also be interesting to estimate the orientation of the device. So if I have my, my phone here, the phone has a certain position, but I can turn it around to have different orientations. And also the clock bias, like in GPS. So I would say that the minimal problem that you need to solve for 2D localization is the position in 2D, uh, the orientation in 1D, because the 2D object has only one orientation degree of freedom, and the clock bias. So then there are here four parameters. In 3D, you have a 3D position, 3D orientation, and one clock bias, so that's seven dimensional. But let's suppose in general there are NX location parameters. And then my statement here, and this is really the rule of thumb, is that for a localization problem to be solvable, you need that the number of observations is greater than the number of unknowns. Okay, this may seem very obvious, but we will use this in a less obvious way. So for example here, GPS, there are four unknowns, X, Y, Z, and the clock bias, so we need four satellites. Now this is a rule of thumb, so it's not uh, true all the time. There are some technical conditions that may apply, and also, even if it's solvable, there may be ambiguity. So there may be three different solutions far apart from each other that are equally good. But this is our rule of thumb, so please bear this in mind. By the way, you can still hear me, right? If yes. someone could. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. So as I said, GPS will not work indoors because the signal cannot penetrate the, the walls and the windows. So why not use Wi-Fi? So Wi-Fi indoors actually leads to very complex propagation. Typically when you're inside, like here, I, I don't have access directly to Wi-Fi access point in line of sight at least. Um, so 
what people then typically do is something called fingerprinting, which means that uh, someone in this environment would go to many locations and in each location lists all the available Wi-Fi access points, their signal strength and the location and store this into a database. And then when a user goes into this environment, it just reads off the signal strength of all the access points and queries the database and the database returns a position. So this is basically the concept of fingerprinting. And it doesn't really use any geometric information, it just uses the fact that there's a rich scattering environment and different locations have different fingerprints. And here you can get relatively good accuracy up, up to maybe a few meters. Okay, what about 2G or cellular systems in general? So let's see how the different generations of communication systems solve the positioning problem. In 2G, localization was based on cell ID. Okay, so this here is a, it's a base station and there maybe there's other base stations around you and the one that is closest, the one that has the largest signal strength, that's the one that you say this is where you are. So here I have um, a map, I don't know, this is downtown Kansas, where you have uh, a sparse deployment of base stations here and then the user listens to the surrounding base stations and de declares its own position to be the position of the base station in the cell with the highest signal power. So this means you get super rough estimate, maybe hundreds of meters of uncertainty of where you are. So useful maybe for emergency call localization, but not for uh, driving an autonomous vehicle. When we look to 3G, in 3G and 4G, they did something different. They use something called time difference of arrival, which we will see later where you, you have multiple base stations. So here on the right, there are three base stations and you collect measurements from these base stations. And based on that, you can know that you're on the intersection of hyperbola. So these, these kind of yellow areas that they each refer to one hyperbola and you must be on the intersection of those hyperbola. Now they're not kind of very narrow hyperbola, they're really broad because you have uncertainty in the measurement. This leads that you are in a certain region and the size of this region can be very large depending on uh, the accuracy of the, the measurements. So here again, maybe 50, 20 meter uncertainty is reasonable. There are other technologies. So one of these is ultra wideband, which has been recently pushed into the Apple devices. Um, where transmitters and receivers, they exchange very narrow pulses. And narrow, I mean like one nanosecond duration pulses and many of those. And based on dedicated protocols, you can estimate distances between such devices. So for instance, here you have a tag with multiple anchors. The tag listens or exchanges packets with each of these anchors sequentially, determines all the, all the distances and then figure out its position. And this you can also use, for instance, for uh, like a, a smart keychain, right? Where you have your phone going to your car, you do this protocol to figure out your distance to the car and the car will unlock. So I, I would say these are probably the, the, the most common radio-based localization systems around. And I think all, all the technologies that are used inside of these is what we'll cover in this tutorial. Any questions so far? If not, then we, now we start going in a little bit more mathematical detail into the signal models. So, as I mentioned already, I think two times, location is a, localization is an estimation problem. So it has these kind of standard ingredients of estimation, an observation Y, a position X, a statistical model that relates X and Y, maybe a prior of X that you know something of where you are. So in, in this part of the tutorial, we will talk about what is Y and how is it obtained. Okay, and once you know what Y is, then you can try to estimate the location X from Y. So this figure here shows the space of observations and the space of locations, and there's a, a relationship between the two. So from Y to X is called estimation, from X to Y is, is the generative model. All right, so what are different observations that you can think of? The first naive observation will be, let's just take the entire waveform. Okay, let's just take this entire waveform, and that's our observation. This relates somehow to the uh, position, and we use this as for our estimation. Now, this is very not, not very impractical because it's a high dimensional observation. It's not very nice to work with this. So rather than working with the waveform directly, we work with things that are extracted from this waveform, and we'll talk about signal strength, time of arrival, and also different kind of angles. So apart from the waveform, the, the second, um, most naive measurement would be signal strength. So what I write here, and I guess many of you are communication engineers, this is the standard path loss equation, right? Receive power is transmit power, everything in dBm with some constant, and then here you have the path loss. So the power decays with distance, and this is what this figure shows here on the right. So you have the, 
on the x-axis the distance and on the y-axis the path loss. So the, the further you are away, the more path loss you experience. And you could imagine that, okay, given the received power, I can solve for the distance. And this is true in a kind of vacuum, but not in, in any kind of real environment. So what this figure shows is that for any distance, there are many received powers that you could have, depending on the propagation environment. So there's no one-to-one -one mapping. You would have very large uncertainty uh, on the distance based on the received power. That's why signal strength is most often combined with fingerprinting rather than using the path loss equation. And I would say whenever you read papers and wireless communication that use signal strength for localization in, in a multi-path environment, you should be very skeptical if there's no experiment to, to show that it really works. All right, so we've ruled out kind of the waveform itself and maybe the signal strength. Then how about time? Because time is also what GPS is based on. So to understand time, it, it is easy for me to explain it when we consider OFDM. It just, the math becomes a bit nicer, but I don't need to do this, it just becomes nicer. So let's suppose that there's a transmitter that sends a signal over N subcarriers, so this is its vector N, and then the receiver receives the signal after going through a channel with an unknown delay and an unknown gain. Okay, so in the clock of the receiver, this is what the receiver sees. I forget about the noise for now. So on the end subcarrier, the receiver sees the end transmitted symbol, some QAM symbol, the complex channel gain, and then a rotation here that increases with subcarrier index. All right, so this is the, the standard way of how delays manifest themselves in frequency and also does in an OFDM system. Okay, so I have here uh, J2 pi n, n is the subcarrier index from zero to n minus one. Tau is the propagation delay which includes the distance traveled, right, over the speed of light, plus also the clock bias of the receiver with respect to the transmitter, and is the number of subcars, and TS is the, the one over the bandwidth of the OFDM system. I can factorize this observation, and then I have this vector observation, so alpha is the channel gain, and I have a pointwise multiplication of two vectors, the transmitted signal, and then this uh, kind of response vector that depends on the delay. So then uh, to estimate the delay, we have now a very simple observation model where we need to estimate the complex gain and the delay from this observation R, knowing the transmitted signal, because often we work with pilot transmission. So let's now suppose that we are able to estimate this delay, then how do we use this in positioning? <clears throat> okay, the first thing to do is a time of arrival positioning or using time of arrival measurement. So there, there are two devices, device one sends a signal to device two, uh, the, the signal is S of T, it arrives some time later here, so the, depending on the distance over C. But now this uh, time of arrival at the receiver is measured in its own frame of reference, so that's why you need to add a clock bias, right? because the transmitter and receiver do not need to be synchronized. So what you estimate when you estimate time of arrival is actually the distance over the speed of light, plus your own clock bias plus noise. So you need to solve for this clock bias too. Um, a challenge with time of arrival estimates is that when there's a blockage, this can either block the signal completely, so you don't have a line of sight path, or it could happen that the signal is delayed because it goes through this object. All right, so, but time of arrival by itself is probably not enough to, to, to solve for both the distance and the clock bias. So to address this, and this is the, the technology often used in ultra wideband, is something called round trip time or two way time of arrival. Okay, and maybe the, the, the mathematics is not very nice, but the principle is that the first device wants to figure out the distance to the second device. How it does this, it sends a signal S of T, starts a timer, right? It arrives a little bit later at the second device. This device estimates time of arrival and sends the signal back with some delay, delta here. And this delay is a priori agreed, let's say one millisecond. So one millisecond later, it sends a signal back, and then the original device estimates the time of arrival. And this time of arrival will now be two times the distance over the speed of light, plus measurement noise due to time of arrival estimation of, of the other guy, uh, the pre-agreed delta and noise at uh, the, the original uh, transmitter. Okay, so you have two sources of noise, but now since this delta is known a priori, you can remove it and you immediately get the distance. So what you do here is you do distance estimation for each pair of nodes. Now to, to be able to do this, you need probably some dedicated hardware to, to be able to send a signal back exactly at the pre-agreed time. But this is how round trip time works. 
Now, in uh, cellular communication systems, uh, they use something again different, which is called time difference of arrival, which I show here in the uplink, but it's also possible in the downlink. Um, we have here three base stations that are perfectly synchronized and connected to some server. There is a user that sends a signal, broadcasts it to all the base stations. It arrives at a certain base station I based on the distance between the user and that base station. And also is affected by a clock bias, of course. But this now, this bias is the clock bias of the user. So what base station I measures, right, is the time of arrival, which is the distance between the user and itself, divided by speed of light, plus the clock bias of the user, plus noise. And this clock bias is common among all of these base stations because it's the clock bias of the user. So based on this, I can compute so-called differential measurements or time difference of arrival measurements. I take one of the base stations as a reference, I call this base station zero, and I compute these differential measurements. And these no longer depend on the clock bias. And these differential measurements, these are differences of distances and this determines a hyperbola so this tells you that the user at the end of the day and now i'm gonna do something let's see the user must be on an intersection of a number of hyperbola and based on this you can figure out where the user is if you have enough base stations now the nice thing with this is that this scales really well you just need one broadcast per device uh, you do need synchronization among the base station the central communication unit um, yeah, the noises are correlated, which you need to be careful with the processing. But this is a very practical way to do positioning, and this is used in, in, in your current mobile phone. All right, so this covers all the um, delay measurements, so let's move on to angular measurements. Right, Can I so, ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, in the previous uh, slide, uh, if you actually assume that the uh, the clock of uh, all the all the BTS uh, all, all the base stations uh, is uh, I mean uh, let me say it in another way you have a global uh, like a clock and then the user has a bias and all the all the base stations have have a bias compared to the global clock then that is uh, no no I mean, there's a the, all the base stations share the same global clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, if you assume like that, then uh, would be something similar to this, right? So you're saying that th th there's a clock here? Yes. And then each base station has its own clock with its own bias. Yes. But then and you the need user to, as well. But then you need to estimate maybe all the biases of all the base stations. Oh, okay. Then it becomes, then it, the problem is no longer identifiable. Yes. You have too many unknowns. Yes. Yeah, so there are many variations of this problem, but this is the, the, the vanilla version of this problem. Thank you for the question. All right, this is our last measurement, and this is maybe a more complicated one, where you have um, angle of arrival measurements. So on the left side, I will talk about angle of arrival. On the right side, I will talk about angle of departure, which is even more tricky. So let's say that there's a remote transmitter sending a signal to a receiver. So the receiver is located here. The receiver has a number of antenna elements and the transmitter and receiver are in far field so the, the, the wave fronts are plain. And then if we focus on the, on the first antenna at the receiver, the first antenna at the receiver, there's the one here on the right side, the signal will arrive with a certain complex gain and some delay. Right? If we now look at the last antenna element, the one on the left, the signal will arrive um, with the same complex gain with the same delay, at least from the point of view of the signal, because it, it's a narrow band signal, but there will be a phase difference. And this phase difference depends on, on this distance that the wavefront needs to cover between the first and the last antenna. And if the antenna elements are spaced lambda over two apart, you can compute this, this uh, difference here, and this will lead to this phase difference there. So this allows me to collect all the observations across the antenna elements in, in, in this equation at the bottom. So alpha is a common complex gain, a of theta is the so-called uh, steering vector, and n is the noise. And I assume that the signal that is sent is just one, it's just a, a narrow band tone. And then the problem is given the observation to estimate both alpha, the complex gain, and the angle of arrival theta. So the angle of arrival is this angle here that we want to estimate. <clears throat> 
and this is for a linear array and for other types of array you have other um, a of theta of course okay so this i think is relatively easy to understand there's also the the, the converse which is angle of departure estimation so now the, the transmitter is on the bottom Okay. sending signals from all of its antenna to the user, which is the receiver here. And there, now it turns out that the signal that is observed by the user is again a complex gain times the transpose of the steering vector, right? because when you go from uplink to downlink, for instance, the channel becomes a transpose, times the transmitted waveform from the transmitter plus noise. So the receiver here sees a scalar waveform over time and then the receiver wants to estimate the same angle here, but now this is the angle of departure, right? Because it's the angle of departure from the transmitter towards the user. On the left side, this was called the angle of arrival. So it's really the same angle, but it has different interpretation depending on which direction the signal is going. In both angle of arrival and angle of departure, it is important how the array is oriented, right? Because if I had oriented the array on the left side like this, if this was the orientation of the array, then the angle of arrival would be zero, right? because all the waves are just coming orthogonal to the array. This means that when we use arrays, we also need to make sure that we take care of estimating the angles of arrival, angle of departure together with the orientation of the devices. All right, so th this ends the discussion about the different signal models. Any questions so far? I hope there's no question because things are clear, not because everybody's already lost. All right, then, now that we know a little bit about the different positioning systems and different signal models, let's go into the performance bounds. All right, this performance bounds is something that um, I personally really like it, but many people skip this step when they're developing algorithms. And the performance bounds in part try to answer the question, when, when you develop an algorithm, how do you know if it's good enough? Because you, you have an algorithm, you evaluate the performance, then the question is, can you do better? And you can either keep working to find a better algorithm, or you can just derive the bound, and if your algorithm is close to that bound, you know you should stop working on the algorithm. You should instead try to reduce its complexity. Um, these bounds are also useful for other questions. For instance, how should we design a positioning system? Where should we place our anchors? For instance, these bounds can be used to decide for GPS, where should the satellites be placed? Should they be all along the line or in a different kind of placement? Uh, they're also used for signal design. Right? How should we allocate power in the no FDM system to have good distance estimation? And so this is the tool that we will see now that will, can answer those kind of questions. So now things will be get a, a little bit more mathematical and I also will ask you to maybe do a little bit of work. So please pay, pay attention. Oh, I'm sorry for the bad quality of this uh, inset figure, but um, anyway, so the Fisher information concept deals with the following problem. You want to estimate an unknown X from an observation, let's call it Z, given some statistical model. And depending on the problem that you're working on, this should be something that you can relate to, right? It could be that X is the, estimating the channel and Z is a waveform and you have a channel model. Or it could be X is a position and Z are distance estimates given the noise variance of those distance estimates. It could also be that X is like a sequence of bits and Z is a received signal, right? But then this framework doesn't hold. So actually I, I should add one estimate a continuous. So this theory does not hold for discrete variables, it's only for continuous variables. All right. So given this uh, problem setup, we, we can now compute something called the Fisher information matrix. And the Fisher information matrix is something that measures the amount of information observation carries about the unknown. So suppose that x is a two-dimensional variable, x1, x2. Right, this then implies that j of x will be a two by two matrix. And this is really different from communication theory where like rate and capacity are, are scalar variables. Here we work with matrices. 
And along the diagonal, this tells you how much information you have about each of the unknowns. And on the off diagonal, tells you something about independence of those variables. So how you compute this facial information matrix is by this expression here. Um, it may look a little bit intimidating, but actually it's not very complicated. You take the logarithm of the likelihood function, which is something that you would often use anyway when you're doing estimation. You take the derivative with respect to the unknown. Right? And then you have the transpose of this, and then you take expectation over all possible observations. So this, this is how you compute it. I will see some examples later. Um, one way to understand this, okay, and I'm, I'm really sorry about the quality of the figure on the bottom. So on the x-axis, I show x. On the y-axis, I show this logarithm of the likelihood function. And I show different cases. So there's a case in red. And the case in red, I write that it has high curvature, right? So the, the likelihood function is very peaky, which means that when you estimate x, you'll have a, have a very accurate estimate. So that means you have high fissure information. When the, um, for the blue curve, the curve is more flat, right? So it's less peaky. There's low curvature, so you'll have lower fissure information. And when the curve is flat, as shown in black, um, there's no curvature, so then the fissure information is zero. And in that sense, the, the, you can interpret the fissure information as measuring the curvature of the likelihood function. Right? It's, a sec it's kind of like a second derivative, so it tells you how curved is the likelihood function in each of these dimensions. And if it's flat in one of the dimensions, that means you cannot estimate the parameter. All right, so this is just what is fissure information. Now, why do we use this? It turns out that under some technical conditions, no matter which estimator that you develop for x, right, let's say you develop an estimator x hat, and you compute the error covariance, which is this thing, this error covariance is always lower bounded by the inverse of the fissure information matrix if this inverse exists. If the inverse does not exist, that means the problem cannot be solved. And this notation here, that means uh, greater or equal in a positive, positive semi-definite sense. Okay. Now, again, given this expression, you can take the trace of both sides, and then you find this. Okay, and this expression just says that the mean square error on your estimation is lower bounded by the trace of the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. And this is something that we will often use. Okay, so I have my team of students. They should all solve the same estimation problem. They each come with their estimator, and they try, then they can compute this left side. I compute the right side, and I can compare which one is closest to the bound and say, okay, this, is the, this guy did the best estimator. And even if it's not close to the bound, I can say, actually, you should work a little bit more and come back next week. Um, finally, it turns out that when you have a, a case where the observation it's a linear function of the unknown plus Gaussian noise. Then the Fisher information matrix has a, a more compact expression. So you don't need to worry about the logarithm of the likelihood function. You just take the noise-free observation. You take derivative with respect to the unknown. So that's something easy to compute. You plug in the inverse of the covariance. You compute the Hermitian of what you computed before, real part, and done. And this is the expression that you will use most often because in most cases you do have a Gaussian noise. All right, so this is just the basics of Fisher information. Any question about this? Someone just left the meeting. Yeah. Um, Would you say that the, the distribution of the estimator is, is bounded so there's some covariation when you don't take the trace or when you don't take the tr when you yeah. work with this expression yeah but th this just tells me this is like kind of mm. the error covariance of, of the estimator mm. this just tells me how the error covariance relates to this fissure information matrix. okay yeah. so it could tell me a lot about the correlation between the different estimation errors mm. things like that so, so this provides much richer information I'm not sure if I answer completely your question, but uh, you see yeah, I was just thinking out. what how to interpret this. Uh... Yeah, just lower yeah. bound on the error covariance. Mm. Okay, then two more topics that are, are interesting when you want to work with Fisher information matrix. Um, I have a question. Yes. I prefer the slides here. Um, we in CRO bound normally we come to the trace of the matrix. Yeah. So I'm wondering what's the off diagonal elements in the feature information matrix mean? Is there any meaning for that? 
Oh, you're talking about the inverse of the Fisher information meter or the, or the Fisher information meter? The, the, inver the inverse. The inverse or whatever, I, I think kind of related, yeah. Is there right, so, like a, what's the meaning for us of diagonal elements? Yeah, so the, for instance, they will tell you expectation, for instance, of x i minus x hat i with x j minus x j hat. They, they will tell you bounds on these guys. That's the trace, yeah? This, this is an off diagonal element. So this, this, is okay. equal, this is equal to j inverse ij. ij, okay. Yeah. So if you're interested in those quantities, you can get those. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Is this uh, another question? H. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, wouldn't it be a problem to depend on a precise statistical model? Because you assume that you know the statistical model of the distributions. I mean, but this in practical use case this is not the, always the case, right? No, that is true, but you could even have model parameters here, right? So additional parameters that describe your uncertainty about the model and then you could estimate those as well. And you could have prior information on those as well. So I, I explained here for a very kind of vanilla case, but there are many variations of this where you do have prior information where you have model uncertainty. But here we assume that the model is given to us. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I think the question is very relevant, especially in practice, but I don't read it here in this tutorial. There was another question. Yes, uh, I was wondering if we know anything about the achievability of this bound. In any special cases, do we know if the bound is achievable or not? Um, okay, the maximum likelihood estimator will achieve the bound at sufficiently high SNR. Right, so, so typically when you evaluate the bound, okay, an SNR can, can mean different things in different scenarios, but uh, the typical picture is like this. This is the bound, and then you have the estimator, the maximum likelihood estimator will get, okay, it should actually hit the bound for high SNR. And then the practical estimator will probably be worse than that. And I would say you're doing a good job if you have an estimator that's much lower complexity max than maximum likelihood, but also achieves the bound at high SNR. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good. Then we have two more concepts that I think are useful if you want to try Fisher information. So sometimes we are uh, faced with a problem where we have multiple parameters that are unknown, but we don't care about all of them. So for instance, in this example, let's say this is the position. And this is, for instance, the, the channel gain. Right, we need to estimate both, but at the end of the day, we don't care what is the channel, we just want to figure out what is the position. Now let's suppose the Fish information matrix has this structure, A, B, C, right? So guys, it's shown in this equation. What we can then do is compute something called the equivalent Fisher information of x1, and that is, that is the amount of information you have x1 in the presence of the, of, in the presence of a nuisance parameter x2. Okay, and it contains two parts. It contains this part A. So this is the Fisher information you have about x1 if x2 was known. And now you subtract something, which is the information loss due to not knowing x2. Okay, and this is called equivalent Fisher information. And this picture on the right tries to show uh, how to interpret this. So I have the Fisher information matrix. I have the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. This is this guy. This is what I care about, right? Or the inverse of that. So I, I take this block, I invert it again, and then it turns out to have this expression. Okay. So very useful concept when you're dealing with many variables, but you don't care about all of them. And then the last uh, topic is that uh, the transformation of variables. So let's say you've computed the Fisher information of a variable x, where you say, okay, actually, I don't care about x, I care about some transformation of x. And this can happen when you have, for instance, uh, you've computed the Fisher information of, of distances, and you, instead you want to compute the Fisher information of position. Because so there's a relation between position and distance. You can exploit this relation by computing the so-called Jacobian, right, which is this thing and then pre and post multiplying with this Jacobian to get the Fisher information of the unknown eta. Okay. 
And I, I understand all of these things are a bit uh, abstract, so maybe it's good to do one simple example before moving on. So let's suppose you have this problem. You observe Z, right, which is a matrix here, 1, 0, 1, 1 times X. X is a factor of length 2 plus noise, and this noise is um, white across all dimensions. And I ask you, what is the Fisher information of X? So what is J of X, which is a 2 by 2 matrix? Right? And I ask you, how, how can you compute this? And secondly, I ask you, can you compute the equivalent Fisher information matrix of X1 and X2 separately? And third, what happens if I want to transform from X to eta? What is the Fisher information of eta? And I recommend that you just spend maybe uh, two or three minutes on this, and then we will walk through the solution. Okay, so take a pen and paper, and then try to solve this, see where you get. And yeah, maybe it's good I, I write the expression g of x. This real part derivative. So this was the expression we had for the Fisher information matrix for under Gaussian noise. So you can use this to, to compute the Fisher information of X. So I give you uh, two minutes. <laughs> All right, I know I didn't give you much time, but we are in general running a bit low on time given how much we should cover. So I try to write down the, the derivative with respect to X of the noise-free observation. So this here is M of X, right? And this derivative is just the matrix that remains. So it's this, this original matrix. Inverse of the noise covariance is this, and then the transpose, or the Hermitian, because everything is good with the transpose, gives me the transpose of the original matrix. I can then plug this in. Let me go to the next slide, and I find this, right? So the Fisher information of X is just these two matrices, so the original and its transpose, one over the noise variance, and I obtain this Fisher information matrix. So you can interpret that, okay, I receive a little bit more information about X1 than about X2, and the, the, they are coupled, right? You cannot estimate them independently. You can then compute the equivalent Fisher information of X1 or X2, right? So for X1, I would take this diagonal entry here. That's this one. This is the information I have about X1. If X2 was known, minus the inverse of this, so that's this one inverse, and then post and pre-multiplied by these ones. Okay, and it turns out to be one over sigma squared in the end. And I can do the same for X2. Uh, with the transformation, and uh, you can try this yourself, you can compute this Jacobian, so just take the, the derivatives of the 
linear function on the, co on the sign, which gives me a cosine. And then this turns out to be the Fisher information of the transformed variables. And in this case, this is a nice example to show that the Fisher information actually depends on the value of the unknown variable. So the Fisher information matrix does not need to be a constant matrix. It can depend on the unknown variable. Any yeah. question? Yeah, of course, of course. It's when you obtain uh, uh, the second part, uh, like JE of X1 and X2, mm -hmm. the information you get is less compared to what you get in the previous part, right? Because you have forgot about the uh, coupling of X1 and X2, right? But in the first part, I consider all the parameters together. Yes. Right. So in the second part, I consider them separately where the other one is unknown. Mm -hmm. But so, but if I had a problem where I know x2, if x2 was known, and I ask you to compute j of x1, right, you would find 1 over sigma squared, and then it's just scalar 2. This is the Fisher information I have about x1 if x2 was known. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly this part. But because x2 is not known, I have to reduce the amount of information. Yes. Thank you. Any more question about this? I don't know if anybody actually tried it, but uh, at least I, I, I do my best to activate you. OK, so this was a, a toy problem. You can apply this, and we won't do this, but you can apply this to all the kind of measurements that we had. And I provide all these derivations for you later if you want to try. So for timing estimation, you, compute, you can compute the Fisher information of the tau. For angle of arrival, you can compute the Fisher information of theta, angle of departure also. And then for positioning, I will we'll see this in a little bit more detail. You can compute the Fisher information of the unknown position. And for each of these, I have the derivation here that you can try later. The, 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 the principle is always the same. You take the noise-free observation, take the derivative with respect to the unknown parameters, compute this outer product, and then you obtain a Fisher information matrix. And then you compute the equivalent Fisher information matrix of the parameter you really care about. Okay, so this is how you do it for delay. We do the same for angle of arrival, angle of departure, and so forth. Now, I don't have time to go through all of them, but maybe for positioning, it's, it's more interesting. So now let's suppose that you've estimated uh, distances. So you, using, using whatever measurement, for instance, uh, round trip time measurements, you've estimated differences to different anchors, and you are given a bunch of measurements which relate to the distance to the amped anchor plus noise. And the variance of this noise, if you don't know what it is from your estimator, you could use the time of arrival Fisher information matrix or, or its inverse to have a, a, an estimate of this variance. And now the question is, what is the Fisher information of the user location, assuming independent measurements with uh, noise variance sigma squared? And again, I will give you two minutes to solve this. And then you can make use of this fact, that the derivative of the norm with respect to x is a unit length vector uh, pointing from the base station to the user. So spend again maybe one or two minutes to see where you end up. All right, so if you did it correctly, and I think really the problem became very trivial, because your measurements are independent, you have a sum over all of the measurements. And for each measurement, you will have this times its transpose. You will have um, a rank one, two by two matrix. So each measurement from each base station provides information according to a rank one matrix with a certain uh, precision. Right? And here, all the precisions are the same. And this rank one matrix, you can interpret this as providing information in one direction. So um, this is what the figure on the right tries to show. So there's, a, let's say, the base station here. The user is here. And you estimate the distance to the base station. 
that means you must be somewhere on this circle. And this gives you a lot of information in this direction, right? Because you, you know for sure you cannot be here, you cannot be here, but you should be on the circle. So for that reason, the information or is very large in one direction, and this is exactly the direction given by this vector. In the orthogonal direction, right, which is the, the, the one here, we know nothing. We could be anywhere locally here, and we don't know, we have no information about this. So that's why we get one-dimensional information. Um, from this Fisher information, which is a two-by-two two matrix for two-dimensional position, we can compute the inverse, the trace, and then the square root. And this is something called the position error bound. And in many papers on, on radio localization, they use this term position error bound. And the nice thing is that this is something expressed in meters. So you see, position error bound is five meters. That means in this location, your, your expected error will be around five meters. So let me now try to visualize this. Okay. So I visualize now for a case with three anchors, this position error bound across space. So how you can interpret this figure, there are three base stations. So I don't know if I can draw this. There's base station one, base station two, base station three. The user can be anywhere. So let's say the user is here, um, here. The user estimates distances to all of these three base stations. And in this location, we can compute the position error bound. Okay, and the position error bound is just a number that is expressed in meters. Okay, and this is what is shown with these colors here. So in this position, the error bound will be maybe, I don't know, 10 centimeters. If the user were on another location, let's say the user was here, in this location, we could also compute the position error bound and now it will be higher. So automatically you see that the further away the user is from the base stations, the higher the position error bound will be, so the worse the positioning quality will be. And you can use this information to, to move the base stations around in the best possible place so that your position error bound is overall quite good. And this is a common use of, of position error bound and Fisher information. Okay, so th this was maybe the most tough part of the tutorial. Now we go more to lighter topics. Any question about so far? Hank, I do have a question. Hmm. So for all these uh, uh, versions of, of uh, localization, uh, like time of arrival, angle of arrival, that you showed expressions for, mm. for Fisher information and so on. Uh, is it something that, that, that you typically have to collect through many papers or there is a good book which basically goes through these kind of things? Um, I, I don't know if there's a good book that has all of these together in a kind of coherent way of writing. Mm -hmm. No, um, I, I, I derived them from scratch just for this tutorial actually. Oh. Yeah. So exactly that was the question. Okay. Yeah, but, but usually they are very straightforward to derive. So okay, okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. So you can try yourself, and then if, if you are stuck, you can email me. No problem. Good. Um, I will go on with this last part. I'm, I'm running a bit close to my deadline, but um, I think we can postpone the, the the break a few minutes. The last part of the the first. Uh, Part of the tutorial will be on localization algorithms. I, I cannot go in much detail, so it will be a little bit superficial, but I would say that typically we use a, a kind of layered approach, just like in communication, you have a physical layer, Mac layer, and so forth. We have the same in, in positioning. So you have the waveform that is coming in. From this waveform, you would estimate channel parameters. From this channel parameter, you would convert them to distances or bearings. So the channel parameters could be time of arrival, and the time of arrival you convert to a distance. And then this you, you feed to a positioning unit, which takes into account prior information, gives you a position estimate. And this is the common way that we do positioning, and this is the way that I will explain today. There's an alternative way, which is called direct positioning, where you take the waveform directly and you map with a positioning unit to the position directly. So this, of course, will give you, in principle, better performance because you don't throw away any information, but it's more complex. Okay, but we mainly will focus on this first layered approach. Now, as I said before, positioning is an estimation problem, so we just use our standard toolbox of estimation theory to solve these kind of problems. So the problems are always, or almost always, of the same form. They're of the form, an observation is a function of the unknown plus noise. How do you solve these problems? Well, you can apply your standard technique. The, the most simple thing to think about is least squares. If I don't know anything about the noise statistics, 
This is the least squared objective function. So I want to find the x that after I push it through the nonlinearity looks most like my observation and I minimize with respect to x. A bit more sophisticated is maximum likelihood where I can exploit the noise statistics. And if I know the noise is Gaussian, I would obtain this kind of uh, expression. And here you see this is almost the same as least squares, but you have a weighing based on the noise covariance. So that measurements which have lower noise uh, are, have a higher weight. If you have prior information, you could maximize a posterior. So where you have the part of the likelihood function and the logarithm of the prior. Okay, but all of these at the end of the day are optimization problems with respect to x, just with different objective functions. Now, the challenge here is that, well, almost never these problems are convex because this f of x is typically a very nasty nonlinear function. You have distances which involve norms, you have angles of arrival and departure which involves cosines and tangents. So you cannot hope for a convex optimization problem. So as a simple example of, of how this would work, so let's suppose we want to do angle of departure estimation where the, the transmitter is sending a, a signal S. This is passed through the channel which is determined by this uh, steering vector and we have an unknown channel gain. So if you may recall before we had the observation R which is alpha A transpose theta S plus noise and here S and A are uh, vectors, R is an observation, and let's say we collect many observations like this, so we send them over time like this, and I stack them into a vector and I reshape them, I will get this kind of observation. Okay. And this is the angle of departure estimation problem where alpha is unknown and theta is unknown. How you solve this, this is the least squares uh, approach. It's here identical to maximum likelihood. So I have a least squared objective with alpha and theta are unknown. Um, I can first set the derivative with respect to alpha to zero, and this gives me a solution of alpha as a function of theta, and this happens very often when you have a linear parameter, you can express its estimate as a function of all the other parameter, and then I can plug this back in in the objective function, and this turned out to be my final objective function over the angle of departure, and this now is a scalar function, so I can just plot this, right? So this here is the angle of departure on the x-axis, on the y-axis, this, this distance function, which depends on the angle of departure. And you see that there's a nice peak at the true value. On the other hand, this function is very nasty. You cannot just say, I'm going to do gradient descent from some initial guess and hope for the best. But if you have a one-dimensional problem, you can do a line search and have good performance. Okay, so this is just an example for angle of departure estimation. You can do the same for positioning. And again, you can have very nasty... Um, non-linear functions with lots of local optima. So this means that um, well, you, you could do gradient descent. So this is the, how you would do gradient descent for least squares and it has some nice interpretation, but this will get stuck in a local optimum. So often what we are stuck with is that we need an initial estimate to start our gradient descent. We would like to do gradient descent, but we don't want to start it from any random estimate. So how do we get this initial estimate? And there are two techniques that you can use. One is that you do convexification. So this is a reformulation of the, maximum, of the least squares problem, right, where I write I want to minimize a so, a some of these epsilons, where each of these epsilons is the difference between the, the, the unknown distance and the observation. This, this turns out to be equivalent to the least squares problem, but because this is an equality constraint with a nonlinear function, I cannot solve this. So if I were to draw a picture of this, it would look something like this. So the least squares problem is something like this. I want to find a point in space that minimizes the distance to all of these circles. But this is a non-convex problem because a circle is not a convex shape. And the way that you would convexify this is that you relax the circle to a disk. So you're allowed to search anywhere inside this region and then you can solve this problem. Okay, so then I just replace this equality like this. You can solve it and you will find an estimate and you can use this estimate to initialize the, least, the gradient descent. Now, even this is somehow cumbersome because not all problems are easy to convexify and you need a lot of kind of knowledge and convex optimization to, to be able to massage the problem in a convex structure. So that my approach is um, I guess the, the lazy engineer approach, and I, I try to convey laziness with these pictures on the right, um, where you just make a few educated guesses. Okay, you just, let, let me try these guesses and see which one has the lowest cost, and that's my initial guess. 
And an example would be the following, right? So let's suppose that you're estimating, you want to estimate your position and you get distance estimates from 100 anchors around you. So you, you have to be on the intersection of 100 circles. And this is a very nasty objective function, lots of local optima. But instead of saying, okay, I'm going to convexify it and then solve this convex optimization problem with lots of variables, lots of constraints, let me just take a bunch of anchors. Let me just take three anchors that have good measurements and that are well separated and find the intersection points of the corresponding circle and, and run gradient descent from that. And do this a bunch of times and see which one works out. And this, even though it's very simple, it works out for many optimization problems in localization very, very well. Now, there are also other variations of doing estimation where you can uh, compute distributions over the unknowns like variational Bayesian methods. Uh, I, I cannot cover these either. Um, then these variational Bayesian methods you can extend to dynamics when the user is moving, when the position orientation are changing over time. And then you would use Kalman filter-like approaches like extended or curvature Kalman filter or a particle filter. And I'll be happy to talk about more, more in detail about those in, in another time. With this, I think I will there end this first part of the tutorial uh, where we covered all the basics of radio localization. And then the second hour or the second, let's say, 50 minutes, we will talk about more advanced topics in 5G. So let's take a break now for um, maybe five minutes. Is that okay? Yes, fine. Good. Okay, then we reconvene in five minutes. So that's at uh, 10 past one, at least in my time zone. Thank you. A any question in the meantime? I, I have a more uh, a specific question um, because I'm working with this localization. I'm not, uh, if anyone has some general questions, they can go first. We have a very shy audience, so please yeah. go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm in the group with Petar. Uh, mm. You helped us uh, last, uh, before the summer, with some, uh, some theory about localization. I'm not sure if you remember this. Mm. Um, so we are reviewing the, the location theory, and we're thinking, so we want an, an estimator. We want to characterize the statistics for, for localization. Um, and then, so according to, to this uh, theory that you just presented, we say that the distribution of the estimator, say we want to, I think we're using uh, time difference of arrival estimates, uh, and we calculate the fish information. Would you then say that the, the distribution of the, we, we estimate two coordinates, mm -hmm. is that then according to this Covariance matrix. Um, yes, that's what I, that's what I would use. So you you, yeah. you typically would have an estimate of, of mm -hmm. where you are. Yeah. Then you evaluate the Fisher information matrix in that estimate. Yeah. And that's a good guess of, of your error covariance there. <gasps> well, yeah. So, so you have. Use. Yeah. So you have some covariation possibly. Yes. Yeah. <gasps> exactly. Mm -hmm. Then maybe one other question. Um, so this um, variance matrix uh, of the noise, maybe that depends on, say, the signal strength. Um, mm -hmm. And then if the signal strength depends on location, then maybe when you de derive the fish information, you need to take the derivative respect to that as well. Is it, that? It, it depends. It depends. Yeah. So typically, the, the channel gain mm -hmm. will depend on the position or, or the mm -hmm. distance, at least. And that it depends whether you want to ask, when, whether you want to exploit this knowledge in your estimator or not. Mm. So if you say a priori, I'm not going to use the channel gain for positioning; it's just an additional unknown. Mm. Then I don't need to worry about this dependence. On the other hand, if you say, okay, I will use the signal strength as a way to assess the distance, then you need to take this into account explicitly. Same mm. with the noise covariance. Yeah, I think that that answers it. Cool. <gasps> okay, I will take a quick break now. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think we can get started again. I hope you had a refreshing break. I know I did. Before we get started on the 5G localization, any questions about the first part? Anything you want to ask? 
Anybody wants to confirm that you can hear me? Yes, everybody. Yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. No further questions? All right, maybe questions will appear later. So now, I, I hope you get some feeling of the basics, right? The different systems, the underlying signal models where you estimate angles and delays, the performance bounds, which tells you how good an estimator can be, and then the, the practical estimator that you can develop. So now we will try to apply some of this knowledge to, to 5G and beyond 5G localization. And, and this is really, I would say, state-of-the-art research. This is the research that we're currently doing. So I think I, I cannot go into great detail, but I, I will give you some flavor of uh, these topics. <clears throat> So I will start by describing some of the benefits of 5G and beyond 5G for localization. Why is this interesting for us? Some of the models and methodologies, uh, the use of intelligent surfaces, and also a little bit on 3D orientation estimation. And then I'll wrap up with conclusions. So this is the same figure I showed in the beginning, right? Base station and user, they're both have many antennas, unknown propagation environment, signal bouncing of the environment. We want to estimate the user state, location, clock bias, orientation. We want to map the environment. We want to do this when the line of sight is blocked. And I will add now one more ingredient, uh, which is that we will exploit intelligent surfaces to shape the propagation environment to help positioning performance. So I, this is basically the same figure as before. And again, now you know a little bit about how these measurements can be collected, that you can compute angles and delays and how they can be used for positioning. Now, why is 5G positioning interesting? This is a picture I took from, from this paper here. Now it's from two years ago, where they show uncertainty levels on the x-axis and different deployment scenarios on the y-axis. And they talk about all these different standards that exist for positioning. And they show that there's this gap, right? There's a gap of having very accurate positioning in indoor and urban outdoor scenarios. And the view is that 5G can, can meet the requirements here in, in this very tough deployments. So in, in the first part of, the, of this talk, I will talk about why this could be so. What, what is the reason for this? So this means I will talk about the, the benefits of uh, 5G and beyond 5G for localization. Okay, so in 5G, the, there will be five benefits I will talk about. So going to higher carrier frequencies, larger bandwidths, large number of antennas, device-to-device, -device, and network densification. And by the way, there's a, there's a very nice, um, massively undersided paper, on, on uh, the white paper on, on new localization by the IRACON cost action, which I really recommend that you have a look at. It goes into many more details about what I talked today. Then beyond 5G positioning, you will have the same five ingredients of high carriers, large bandwidth, large number of antennas, device-to-device, -device, and network densification. But in addition, you will have two new things, which is the ability to shape the environment through meta surfaces and the, the more dominant use of arti artificial intelligence. So what I will do now for the next seven slides is just go through each of these and explain why they are interesting for positioning. So first of all, high carrier frequencies. Now, here you have a, a picture showing a transmitter, a receiver, and a propagation environment, and there's a channel matrix in between. And if you've taken any wireless communication course, and then for those of you in the, audience, in the audience who have taken my course, you know that typically when you teach how this channel is generated, you will say, okay, this is a full rank matrix with IID Gaussian entries. Okay, maybe not full rank, but a full matrix with IID Gaussian entries that populate this whole matrix. And this is because you have a rich scattering environment, so you could really fading assumption holes. Now, this is true for low carrier frequencies, but at high carrier frequencies, this is no longer true because you will have uh, no propagation through obstacles, limited diffraction. So that means that the channel becomes parametric. So this H of T, even though it could be a 20 by 20 matrix, it will be described by very few geometric parameters. And this is the typical channel model that you see at a millimeter wave, which is a, a superposition of multiple paths, here L paths. Each path has its own complex gain. Each path has its own delay, tau l. Then there is a steering vector from the transmit or from the receiver side for, as a function of the angle of arrival. So this represents the array at the user in this case. And there's a, a steering vector at the base station side as a function of the angle of departure. And now you know what these angles mean. 
and then for each of the paths there is such an angle. And so this is how you can describe the, the channel, even though it's a very high dimensional object, it is described with very few geometric parameters. Okay, so overall, the, the benefit of going to high carrier frequencies is that we will have a sparse communication channel, which is very strongly related to the physical environment. So good for positioning. Secondly, when we have large bandwidths, because we go to these high carrier frequencies, especially because there is high bandwidth, means that we will have better delay estimation accuracy. This actually follows from the fissure information analysis, even though we didn't uh, go through it in detail for time of arrival estimation. It also provides uh, better resolvability, so you can separate multipath components better. And this is a figure I took for, from this paper here from TU Graz, where they show in the delay domain, so this is the, for each horizontal slice is a channel impulse response as a function of moving the position of the receiver. Okay, so there's a transmitter somewhere there, there's an environment and the receiver is moving. And as the receiver is moving, the line of sight path, which is the first path here, is changing in terms of delay, right? Because when you get closer to the, to the transmitter, the delay is shorter. When you get further away from it, the delay is longer. But you don't just see this line of sight path, you also see additional multi-path components. You see very, very, several very strong paths, and these correspond to objects in the environment. And you can only see this when you have enough bandwidth available. So here this was for 2 giga, gigahertz. So what large bandwidths buy you is a higher degree of resolvability of multipath. You see paths arriving at separated delays. Good for positioning. Third, a large number of antennas is good because when you have a large number of receive antennas, that means you can listen in more fine directions, very roughly speaking, so you will get more fine angle of arrival estimation. Uh, when you have a transmitter with many antenna elements, you can send very fine beams in different directions, so you'll have better angle of departure estimation. So a large number of antennas provides you higher resolvability in the angular domain. This means that two paths that are arriving with exactly the same de delay but with different angles, you can separate them. Or two paths with the same angle and different delay, you can separate them. We will have device-to-device -device communication, so here is a figure of two phones where one of them is connected to the base station, the other one is not. If the first phone that is connected to the base station can be localized, it can help the other guy to be localized uh, by a device-to-device -device link. And this is known as cooperative positioning, and this can also provide a radar-like functionality even when there's no base station available for relative positioning. Okay, this is the fifth of the seven topics, so when we go to higher frequencies, we will need to put many more access points which means that there's a higher degree of uh, higher possibility for line of sights. And the line of sight link is of course the most important link for positioning. It's not strictly needed, but it's the one that brings the most fissure information. So with more network densification, we'll have a higher chance of line of sight, uh, good for positioning. So these are all the properties that are typically considered in 5G. When we go beyond 5G, we'll have the use of intelligent surfaces. So an intelligent surface is a, here a surface comprising of many small elements with a controllable phase. And this allows that an, a wave that coming into the surface can be controlled in terms of the direction that it is reflected to. So you can see this as a reconfigurable electromagnetic mirror. Uh, such a surface can also act as a lens, so it can kind of focus energy into one point. The reason why this is often used is uh, well, it, they see it, it's something cheap to deploy, it has low power consumption, does not generate its own data, but it can be controlled to direct signals in a preferred direction. So for instance, if there's a source and a destination and the line of sight is blocked, you can create still a very long, very strong signal from the intelligence surface to the destination. So you can shape the environment to improve communication. From the positioning point of view, it's very interesting because there, these intelligent surfaces, they are new position references, with a controllable SNR, and you can also get new measurements from these surfaces. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later. Um, th they have different names, I should maybe mention this. So I call them reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. You also have large intelligent surfaces here, it's written as least. There is IRS, which is intelligent reconfigurable surfaces, which I don't like because it's like the US uh, tax revenue service. Um, I think there's other names as well, but I will use RIS. And then finally, there's the more uh, dominant use of artificial intelligence, where we try to solve the positioning problem by using the relation between the channel and the user location without needing to know the underlying mathematical structure. 
Uh, often you will still exploit some form of sparsity to convert your channel response to some suitable domain. But roughly speaking, how this works is that you have a neural network with as input the, the channel, transformed in some way, uh, as labeled the user location. You train this network with many training data and then uh, when a new channel is presented, you can directly convert it to a location. And I would say that artificial intelligence, while very popular right now, uh, is not suitable for all problems, but maybe for those for which we don't have a, a good model of the, or those for which the, the standard techniques are too computationally complex, they are a good alternative. All right, so this was the, the benefits of uh, 5G and beyond 5G for localization. So now we will try to um, make the, the problem that I showed before, the, the 5G positioning problem, a little bit more mathematical. Not too much, but uh, just a little. And then we get something like this. So this picture here shows the same as what we had before, a base station, a user, an environment with objects. Uh, here we have small objects, these are scatter points. We have large objects like walls. And then we show the different multipath components. So there's a multipath component from the base station directly to the user in green. There's a multipath component bouncing off this small object to the user. And there's a multipath component bouncing off this large object to the user. And the user has an unknown position, an unknown heading, and an unknown clock bias. Cool. And this is all we want to estimate. And this is in a condition where we don't know anything about the environment. So also we need to map the environment, figure out where are these large and small objects. Okay, how we do this is we start from our observed waveform. So this is a typical observed millimeter wave waveform where X of T is the signal transmitted at the base station, a pilot signal. F is a pre-coding matrix used at the base station, which can be used to, to shape the signal, also to convert from a lower dimensional um, representation to a high dimensional representation if you have more antennas than RF chains. W Hermitian is the combiner at the receiver, which could be listening to certain preferential directions. And then you have the channel where you have, again, a superposition of paths. For each path, you have a channel matrix, which is determined by a complex gain, angle of arrival, angle of departure, and a delay. And then, of course, you have the noise. Now, the first step is the, the channel estimation step, where we try to estimate from this observation the parameters of delays and angles. And then given these delays and angles, we want to then solve for the user state and the map. So the, 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 the challenge here is that we don't know which of the measurements comes from which object, right? So after channel estimation, we'll get a bunch of uh, triples here, delays and angles. And you don't know which of these triples comes from the line of sight, which comes from the lamppost, which comes from the wall. Maybe you don't even know that there is a wall or a lamppost. And this leads to a data association problem. Also, well, the lamppost and the, the big surface, they, they behave in a quite different way. When the user, user is moving along this line, the lamppost stays fixed, right? So the, the path is always hitting the lamppost and then going to the user. But when the user is moving, this incidence point on the wall is moving along. It's like when you're driving by a building, you see the sun reflected. As you move, the sun will appear to move along that wall. So to describe the environment, we need to have a good definition of the state of the environment. And the way that we do this is by small objects we represent by their position, and large objects we represent by so-called virtual anchors. So, so this virtual anchor is the reflection of this base station with respect to this wall. And this is a fixed point in space. So this means if the user is now here, right, then there's a line from the virtual anchor to the user which intersects in the surface and then the path will go from the base station to this point towards the user. Okay. Sorry for my bad drawing, but I hope it makes sense. Okay, so this is the challenge. Now, the reason that we can't solve this problem goes back to the, the rule of thumb that I explained at the very beginning. Suppose that we're working in a three-dimensional environment, then each object has a three-dimensional unknown. Right? The scatter point has a three-dimensional unknown. And uh, the large surface has also a three-dimensional unknown. But for each object that we have in the environment, we have a five-dimensional measurement. Right? So we have far more measurements than unknowns. So this means with enough objects in the environment, we should be able to solve the problem. Without any objects, you cannot solve the problem. Right? Because without any object, you just have five measurements, which is the line of sight, 
um, from the base station. But the number of unknowns can be 3 for the position, plus the clock bias, plus the orientation, which can be also 3. So you cannot solve the problem. But with enough non-line of sight paths, even if you don't know where they are, in principle you can solve the problem. Okay, I will skip this one. Good. Now, in, in order to break down the positioning problem, we, we, we work on separate problems in, 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 our, in our team. And these are some of the highlights of things that we are doing. So uh, we break down the problem into uh, signal design to design good signals to help positioning. We work on, on channel estimation to recover the geometric parameters of the underlying channel. We work on data association, which means to, to associate measurements to objects in the environment that we've seen before. And then we work on positioning and mapping. And we'll just briefly present one slide on each of these topics. So the first is a signal design. And here the question is that, okay, if you are a base station, and there's a user that should position itself using angle of departure estimation or angle of arrival estimation, what, what kind of signal should I send to that user? And it turns out by, by applying the methodologies from, from this paper, you can convexify this problem using fissure information theory. So here we use fissure information theory as a way to design signals. And we get some kind of interesting results. So let's focus on the figure on the right. So let's suppose that there's a base station, let's say somewhere here with some antenna array. There's a user somewhere here with an unknown position, uh, also with an unknown orientation, has some array. And the base station needs to send a signal to that user to help the user estimate the angle of arrival, so th this angle. What kind of signal should the base station send to the user? Okay. And it turns out that the optimal precoder looks like this. And it basically tells you to beam as much energy as you can towards the user, which makes sense. And this yellow region refers to the fact that we don't know exactly where the user is. There's some angular range where we know the user is, but we don't know exactly where in that range the user is. On the other hand, we could do something else, which is to say maybe the user has only one uh, receive antenna. We have our base station. Again, there's a user here with one receive antenna. We know more or less where the user is, and now we want to design a signal to send to the user to help the user to estimate the angle of departure. So let me draw it like this. This is the angle of departure. And it turns out you can solve an optimization problem and find the best possible precoder at the base station. And it turns out to be a precoder that looks like this. And basically, it's a kind of signal that has lots of rippling across the angle of departure. Because you, you want to send signals in many different directions at the same time so that the user can distinguish it. And then the figure on the left shows, okay, if I want to have both angle of arrival and angle of departure, optimal precoders, what should I do? Now, the, the signal design is, is um, per se not something new. This has been, been applied in other dimensions as well. So here I talk about the spatial dimension, but you can also do signal, signal design in time and frequency. Right? So if, if you want to have good delay estimation, you have some time frequency resources available, what is the best thing to do? Is it good to, for instance, send only signals here? Or is it better to send only signals maybe here? So questions like this can be solved using Fisher information theory, and they lead to good signal designs. And this is what is used right now in, in, uh, in 4G and 5G. All right, so this is a little bit about signal design. So once you've designed the signal, you send a signal to the user, the user needs to estimate the channel. So how we estimate the channel is we exploit sparsity. So as you know, the channel of, was something of, so something of this form. The channel is a superposition of paths, L minus one, some gains, a received angle, a transmitted angle, and then some delay, tau minus tau L, something like this, right? And this channel is, uh, even though this channel itself is an enormous matrix or a high dimensional object, it is described by very few parameters. So in order to, to get access to these parameters, you need to apply some transformation. And this is similar to what people do, for instance, in image processing. If you have an image, an image is a, a full matrix, but if you apply a Fourier transform, you will find something that's really sparse that only has energy in the lower frequencies. 
So you can do something similar here, and this is called uh, beam space. So by transforming your observation to beam space, you immediately see the sparsity. Okay, and this is when you transform a channel, you see here angle of departure, angle of arrival, and you see that there are three paths in this channel, and immediately you can read off their angle of departure and angle of arrival. And then you can apply methods from compressed sensing to, to recover angles and delays. And if you want to play around with this, we actually have an implementation on GitHub, I think for a two-dimensional scenario where you estimate angles of arrival, angle of departure and delay uh, using this uh, orthogonal matching pursuit method. But basically, we, we, we just apply relatively standard techniques from channel estimation, millimeter wave, and then use them for positioning. The next question is a data association. So this relates to the question, how are measurements related to landmarks? And th there are many ways to do association. So again, the question is, you, you receive a measurement here, and maybe there are different objects. There was also a lamppost in the environment. And you don't know, does the measurement come from the wall? or from the lamppost, right? But what you can do is you can compute probabilities of this. You can see to what extent does the measurement match coming from the wall or coming from the lamppost, so this generates hypotheses. And then given this, there are many ways to, to solve the association problem. One is to do hard association, so to find the most likely assignment between measurements and objects. And you can do this using something called the Hungarian algorithm, so to solve linear assignment problems. You can also do soft association where you say, okay, if there was another object, let me try to draw this properly. So there was another object here. And then you can say, okay, with some probability, this path came from this object with 0 0.9 and some probability 0 0.1, the measurement came from the lamppost. And we keep track of these probabilities. Uh, you can also keep track of all association probabilities uh, over time and to have kind of tracks. Or there are also methods that are association free, such as a probability hypothesis density filter. And I think, yeah, if you want to know more, here is a paper that uses this uh, hypothesis density filter for this kind of problem. But all of these methods basically boil down to generating new hypotheses when you have measurements and then associating measurements with all hypotheses and then truncating hypotheses that are, that are no longer very probable. I think yeah, this is an, an animation from uh, one of our students, and you can find more information about this in this paper. So what this figure shows is that there's a base station here in the center. There's a user moving in a circle around the base station. In the environment, there are virtual anchors. So this is a virtual anchor. So this corresponds to a wall. Let me try to draw this between the base station and the user. So there's a wall here, which leads to a virtual anchor, which is the reflection of the base station with respect to the wall. There are scatter points here, four scatter points. Okay, there are, there's a wall here too, a wall here too, here too. Okay, I will remove these walls now. Um, there's a dome around the user, which reflects which scatter points the user can see. So when the user is here, it cannot see this scatter point, but when the user will be here, it will be able to see that scatter point. And in the beginning, the user knows very little. It knows nothing about the map. It knows something about where itself is. And it, as it drives around this circle, it will try to build up a map of the environment. So this is what will happen. So over time, okay, so now the user is here. It has already mapped all the base stations. So it's figured out that there are, no, not the base stations, the, the walls. It's figured out that there are virtual anchors in these locations. It already seen that there's a scatter point here. And you see also that in some locations there are uh, clutter measurements, because maybe the channel estimation is not perfect. So then it generates temporary hypotheses here, but over time it discards them because they are not very probable. Okay, so moving along in the circle over time, it figures out everything of the environment. And then in the end, it will map this, this last scatter point when it gets close to it. Okay, so now the vehicle has mapped the environment. Here there were only static objects, but you can extend this also with dynamic objects. And now the nice thing is when another vehicle goes in the same environment, the first vehicle has already mapped the, the, the environment for him. So this map can be reused for the next vehicle. Um, now here is a, just an example of uh, so some performance of positioning. So the question here is uh, a 2D problem where you have a transmitter on the left side, a receiver on the right side. The receiver has an unknown position an unknown orientation, 
Um, the scatter points here have unknown positions. All you know is the location of the transmitter and the orientation of the transmitter. And the question is, can you estimate everything here? And now I hope by, by the knowledge that you have that the answer is yes, right? Because if you look at the line of sight path from the transmitter to the receiver, the number of measurements we have, let me just write measurements, we have three measurements, angle of departure, angle of arrival, and delay. Uh, the unknowns, how many unknowns do we have? We have three unknowns. Because we have the bias, no, but we actually here we don't have a clock bias, we have the position and the orientation. If we add one additional path, we will have three more measurements, so we'll have six measurements, and we will have five unknowns. If we have two non-line of sight paths, we will have nine measurements and seven unknowns. So you see that this difference will grow. So we get more and more measurements and the number of unknowns doesn't grow as fast. So we should be able to estimate all of the parameters. And now this is what, what the figure on the left shows. So what we've done here is uh, the, the receiver has collected the signal. It applied this um, orthogonal matching pursuit to estimate the channel parameters. And then we used, uh, I think in this case, just least squares to figure out the position. On the x-axis is the signal to noise ratio. On the y-axis, the root mean square error. Um, now in red is the position error bound, which you've seen in the first part of the tutorial. So this is the lower bound of the algorithm. And in blue is the performance of our algorithm. And even though this is a very simple algorithm, you see that for high SNR, it gets close to the bound. So that's very good. We don't need to work harder to improve the algorithm. For low SNR, it deviates, but this is very common. This is because of noise peaks. And here, again, the scatter points were not known, so we've also estimated the scatter point locations, but I don't show the performance of this. Okay, now what happens when we remove the line of sight? Okay, so now we only have no line of sight. So in this case, let's look again at the measurements and the unknowns. Okay, if we have only line of sight, we have no... Okay, if there's no scatter points, we have no measurements, and we have three unknowns. If we have one scatter point, we have three measurements and uh, five unknowns, so we cannot solve it. For two scatter points, we will have six measurements and seven unknowns. For another path, we'll have nine measurements, and now we have nine unknowns. So now we have a chance of solving it. Okay. And I think in this case, we did in fact have three scatter points, so we should be able to solve the problem. And then this is the performance that we get. Okay, and this is taken from, from this paper, which was one of the early papers in uh, millimeter wave localization. So again, we have the bound in red from fissure information, and in blue is the algorithm. And you see again, for high SNR, you can get close to the bound. For low SNR, you have a gap. Um, of course, since the line of sight is very strong with respect to the other paths, the, the values that you get here are much worse than the values you have when the line of sight is present. Good, so this is some of kind of the basic components of, of 5G localization. Any questions so far? Good, then we have uh, 20 minutes left, so I will just cover them the last two topics. So the first one here is uh, the use of intelligent surfaces for positioning. So intelligent surfaces, they are um, now widely studied for communication purposes. And the story is more or less as follows. So you have a base station, you have users, the line of sight could be blocked. So you don't have a good link between the base station and the users, but you have this intelligent surface. There's a channel from the base station to the surface, which depends on the number of base station antennas N and the number of um, elements in the surface M. Then there's a channel from the surface to the user. This is just a, a row vector, right? Because the user is assumed to have only a single antenna element. And then the RIS itself, the surface itself, is characterized by this uh, matrix of phases omega. And this is a diagonal element which just tells you how you set the phase for each of these elements. So each of these elements has a controllable phase. Then the observation at a certain user is given by the concatenation of these components, so it's the transmitted signal, the channel from base station to the RIS, the configuration of the RIS, and this channel from the RIS to the user plus noise. And now, okay, if the line of sight is there, then you also have the line of sight path. 
But now the cool thing is that you can configure these phases to create basically a, a strong signal towards a certain user. And this allows you to overcome line of sight blockage. Uh, it also has other benefits like low power consumption and, and low EM pollution because you can direct signals to, to places where users really are. And yeah, there's, I think, many, many papers appearing every day now on this topic. But then, since I said in the beginning, any new technology for communication is an opportunity for positioning. Um, you can also then use these technologies for positioning. And there's this magazine paper that we recently wrote where we want to do positioning under line of sight blockage. We want to use these surfaces for near field localization because these surfaces can be quite big. That means the far field assumption of plane waves is no longer valid. Our waves will be curved, so we can get some performance benefits for this. Uh, we can do localization in a very the dense multipath environment and maybe even enable uh, new applications. Now, I, I don't uh, have time to go into great detail. I just want to show some, some comparisons between different um, technologies and, and how, or different kind of objects in the environment and how they affect positioning. So this here is a, is a simplified scenario here on the bottom where I have a base station and then a user, let's say the user is here. And there are two signal paths, a line of sight path and a path from the user to the scatter point to the, no, from the base station to the scatter point to the user. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit tired. Um, the scatter point has a known location, right? So based on that, you, you know that you have a distance from the base station to the user and from the base station via the scatter point to the user. So you must lie on the intersection of two circles, which will be something like this. So there's an intersection point, and then we can compute the position error bound in this point. And this is what really what this figure shows. So in, in meters, we show the position error bound in this deployment region. And what you see is that, okay, in most of the places you can be localized with about two meter uncertainty, except when you're very far away from the scatter point because the, the signal strength is very weak. And also on the line between the base station and the scatter point, you cannot be localized because you get information twice in the same direction. Okay, so the scatter point gives kind of uniform coverage, but very crappy quality. If now we replace the scatter point with a reflector, okay, and then when we are here, we will have a signal from the base station and a signal from the reflector, and we will have good positioning quality. So this is again in meters, but this is only true when we are in the reflection zone of the reflector, right? So we must satisfy this law that th these angles are the same. So there are some locations where this is not possible and then we cannot be localized. So the reflector gives very good positioning quality, but in a limited area. Um, the, figure, the third figure shows when you have two base stations, and this is really the, the best scenario, then you can be localized very well everywhere except on the line between the two base stations. And the last figure is when you have uh, an intelligent surface so that you can um, adjust the phases to, to provide positioning coverage for the user. And what you see is that you get good coverage everywhere, similar to the scatter point, but your performance is much better. So especially in this region here, you're doing much better than the, the scatter point. So this is why RISC could be a kind of promising technology, but it's not as good as a, a real reflector. Okay, so any question about this? I, I know this is, a, for many people, an intriguing topic, so maybe I take a quick break here. No question? You can still hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. All right, then I will move on to the last topic, which is 3D rotation estimation. This is also something that we're working on very recently. So um, the orientation of the user is important because the user itself may need to do beamforming and then track where is the base station in the frame of reference of the user. Um, the user has, in principle, three degrees of freedom. This is shown in this picture in the middle. Uh, this is actually from Apple. I forgot to put the acknowledgement. So there's a, something called pitch, roll, and yaw around the different axes. Um, this is normally tracked with an IMU. So there's an inter internal measurement unit, which is shown here on the right, which, which can track this orientation, but this suffers from an increasing uh, error covariance over time. So then the question that we ask ourselves is, can we use these 5G signals to estimate the user orientation in 3D? 
And this is the again is our first steps in this direction. So this is a simplified problem where you have uh, multiple base stations here, a user with an unknown orientation in 3D, and but the user has a known position just to simplify the problem. So that means the user has a local coordinate system in which measurements are taken. So the user measures um, with its array angles of arrival and elevation and azimuth that are shown here in the local frame of reference. So the measurement model at the user side is um, just as before, multi-path, so one path from each base station with a complex gain, angle of arrival in the frame of reference of the user, angles of departure in the frame of reference of the base station, and transmitted signal plus noise. Now, an important challenge is how do we describe this orientation? And there are many ways that you can do this in the literature. One is called Euler angles, another one is rotation matrix, and the third one is quaternion. So we choose here to use rotation matrices because it was convenient for us. Um, rotation matrices are three by three matrices that have two properties. So they, when you multiply it with its transpose, you find an identity. So this means that when you rotate and then you apply the transpose rotation, you go back to where you were originally. And the determinant is plus one, which means that you don't have any reflections in your rotation. And for, I guess you have seen rotation matrices in 2D. This is what, what this looks like. So rotation matrices in 3D are can be generated by doing rotation matrices in, in 2D and then applying this in different dimensions. So this is how you can generate general rotation matrices. Um, the set of rotation matrices is called SO3. This is the special orthogonal group. And now what makes this a bit challenging is that these matrices are three by three matrices. So they have uh, nine degrees of freedom, but in fact, you have six constraints. So th these things impose six constraints. So that means in this nine dimensional space, the rotation matrices live in a, a lower dimensional space or, or a manifold. So I, I cannot go into detail exactly what we did in this work, but I can show some preliminary results. So first of all, this figure shows to what extent can we estimate angles with an array. And I think this is just interesting by itself. So let's suppose that you have uh, at the user side, this is the user frame of reference. There's a path coming in from some direction and you estimate the um, elevation angle and the azimuth angle. And the question is how well can you estimate those angles? And the way that we can assess this is by using, the, again, the Fisher information. So what we show here is in uh, dB radians, so it's radians converted to dB. How well can we estimate the azimuth angle as a function of the uh, direction of the source? On the right, we show how well we can estimate the elevation angle as a function of the orientation of, of the direction of the source. And what you see is that the azimuth angle on the left side, you can estimate really well for most, uh, most orientations. So for instance, here on the left, everything is good. But when the elevation angle is very small, so here on the left side, you cannot estimate the azimuth very well. So what does this mean? When the elevation angle is really small, that means that the source is somewhere here. So when the source is right on top of the user, you cannot estimate this angle very well, which makes sense, right? On the other hand, for the elevation angle, you cannot estimate it well when the elevation angle is large. So that means when the source is somewhere here on the xy plane, like this, and then this is the elevation angle, you cannot estimate this elevation angle properly. So this is important because this tells us that you cannot, in all orientations, estimate all angles equally well. So what we did then is we developed, of course, the performance bound using Fisher information matrix, and then we also compute different the performance of different estimators. So this is some example of what we did. So we have this scenario two base stations. We pick an orientation that is somehow reasonable. And as a function of SNR, we show the root mean square error in the estimation of the rotation matrix. We have the bound based on Fisher information matrix. And then we have two algorithms, a least square algorithm in blue and a maximum likelihood algorithm in red. And maybe just one interesting detail is that we, we need to run these algorithms in the manifold of rotation matrices. So the, again, the, the picture to imagine this is that you have this a nine dimensional space here, but all the rotation matrices lie in this manifold of SO3. So when you compute gradients, you need to make sure that you, you end up still in this manifold. So there's some 
technical complications here that uh, we share in the in the corresponding paper. But I foresee that there's great potential to estimate both 3D position and 3D orientation using the 5G system itself. So this can help the functioning and the resetting of other sensors in the device, such as uh, IMUs. All right, this brings me to the end of the tutorial. So, well, I, I think what is next, this is a slide I took from a webinar we did yesterday uh, run by the 6G flagship at University of Olo, where we have this white paper that you can download on archive, to, with the URL here, show, here on the right, showing what is our vision for 6G. Right? And then my takeaway is that it will combine many things. It will combine communication with using more antennas, the use of artificial intelligence. You, you will be able to do radar and sensing, localization will adapt to environments, and all of this will be combined in this 6G system, uh, which will enable new applications, and there's a bunch of them shown there. Well, but, oh no, sorry, there are applications here on the right, new technological enablers, and also challenges that we will face, uh, including power consumption and privacy issues. But if you want to know more about this, I really recommend that you read this white paper, which is part of a series of white paper on, on 6G. So there's, there's some one on machine learning, there's one on intelligent surfaces, this one is on localization and sensing. All right, so in conclusion, um, I hope to have convinced you that radio signals are always useful for providing location information. And whenever you read a communication paper, you can ask yourself, how would I use this for positioning? That's what I do. Um, when we go to higher frequencies where large bandwidth is available and where we need to use many antenna elements to, many antenna elements to overcome path loss, positioning becomes very interesting. Right? So we will have a 5G system where we can do single anchor positioning. So with a single base station, we can estimate the user's direction, do synchronization to the environment, map the environment, um, all with a single base station, provided the environment is rich enough in terms of its multipath. So this can be a kind of, of bi-static radar. And 5G millimeter wave positioning is being studied in 3GPP using the kind of measurements I talk about today. Uh, beyond 5G, I see a great potential for intelligent services to boost positioning performance. Nevertheless, there's many challenges to this is still, this is, I think, it's been an active research area for many years, but I see a, a big boost now in, in the coming decade for positioning and sensing using 5G and beyond 5G. And there's an urgent need for measurements to, to kind of provide correct models and to validate all the math that we are doing. But my, my vision is that um, when I show this picture in the future and I show this kind of radar connection between two cars, that if I ask a question, is it radar or is it 5G or maybe 6G, the answer will be that it will be one and the same thing. There will be no difference. And this, uh, this ends my, my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. So we have a few more minutes for questions if anybody has uh, any questions. Otherwise, feel free to send me an email and I, I can share the slides later with, with anybody who's interested. I will try to arrange to have a slides and videos from, from both you and Alex okay. and share with, with everyone. Okay, thank you. Maybe a question regarding uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, because a uh, few years ago, uh, the, uh, were born a particular type of networks called uh, physically informed neural networks, mm. which uh, are based a lot on uh, uh, mathematical theorems uh, to ensure somehow, um, let's say, uh, to find solution to physical problems. So, for instance, in this case, uh, can be the reflections or uh, um, or diffractions in uh, of electromagnetic uh, uh, of electromagnetic waves uh, in a in an environment, and I don't know if you ever heard about them. No, it was the first time I heard it. What, what's the name again? Physically, physical informed neural networks. Okay, I'll, and I'll write it down. Because they uh, became really popular because they were able to predict, uh, uh, for example, uh, flux of uh, air or liquids. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they uh, let, let reproduce somehow this flux, uh, how to say, uh, easily because uh, they don't have to use the entire math, uh, uh, the precise math, but they uh, build 
somehow the an approximation mm -hmm. in an easier way okay. like always neural networks do and this uh for instance let us study better uh some better some phenomena that before were not possible mm -hmm. so i think that also they can be useful also in this context since uh somehow uh there are physical laws that uh that uh uh, impact a lot in yes. uh, in positioning. Yep. So I hadn't heard of this, but thank you for the for the reference. I will check it out. Thank you. So I cannot comment. Can I, can I have a question? Mm -hmm. So in in, in, uh, in your setup here, uh, um, I mean, what I can see, you are dealing uh, generally with the problem when collecting your measurements and trying to recover the unknowns positions plus some other parameters. Uh, this is, as you said, this is a, a non-linear weighted least squares problem. So the problem itself belongs to this category, plus there might be some sparsity in mm -hmm. the, the whole thing. And uh, the tools that you use to solve this, because this is typically, from what I can see, is not a big problem. So you typically mm -hmm. don't have, as a user that wants to position itself, you don't have many unknown variables. You might have I mean, you like to have more measurements, but more obstacles you have, it typically helps you. So it's not a big problem uh, in, in terms of size. Mm -hmm. It's problematic due to non-linearity and, and, and some other aspects, maybe some errors and so on. So uh, you, you typically use like great gradient based optimization methods to solve it, or, or you, you also use something else? Well, it's not big in size, but if you think even just for the user, at least you have a, a three-dimensional position, right? Maybe you, have, you always have a clock by, so that's four, and then a few degrees of freedom of rotation, so up to seven. And, and seven dimensions is already high enough often to, to, to not allow kind of just search. Yes, so I, I, I assume that's what you're alluding to, right? That you can just search the entire space and find the optimum. Yeah, yeah. but then, okay, even if you cannot, then... Uh you are using some sort of gradient-based methods, and then you mentioned it's also the initial point, starting mm -hmm. point, very important. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So we, we use gradient descent on the likelihood function, initialized by something based on, on the geometry, and this itself can involve a kind of smaller least squares problem. Uh, okay. That, that's usually how you get to, to the maximum likelihood solution. One, one more high level question. So for indoors, clearly these fingerprinting methods and, and using deep learning is very popular nowadays, but your setup is more outdoors. So do you see any future possibilities for such a things outdoors or at least in urban outdoors? Oh, sorry, I don't, do you see, because okay, the, the examples I show was mainly outdoor, but I think the principles can hold also indoor. Yeah, 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 but but uh, uh, you are using model-based approach. Right, right, right. Not go around and make some fingerprints of the signals and then try to train some neural. Ah, yeah. The, the issue with fingerprints is that they, they change over time, right? Well, when, when the environment changes, so you, I think that, that that's a bit the challenge. How often should you update those fingerprints? Well, for sure, there are people doing research on this. I just I like model-based signal processing just because I think it provides more intuition and, and you can really see what's going on when you apply neural networks. It's almost like a black box in many cases. And it, to also just as a scientist, it, it's, it's less fun. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, maybe at the end of the day, all of this will be solved by one massive neural network owned by Google. True. Yeah. That's possible. I hope not, though. Good. Some chat messages. I don't know if anybody had a question there. No, no question. Just thanks. Good. But I think we are. We should stop for today. So, thank you for everybody for joining. It was a pleasure. I hope you learned something, or are curious at least about something. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.